Please turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 17, the book of Acts in the New Testament and chapter 17. I'd like to begin a new series looking at Paul's letters to the Thessalonians. And by way of introduction, I thought it would be helpful for us to look at the forming of this church in Acts 17. So let's read God's word together. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. Amen. We'll leave the reading there at verse 10. And let's ask the Lord's blessing as we consider his word together this morning. Our Lord, our God, our Father, we thank you for your word to us that we can read and share together. And we pray now as we come to consider this passage, Lord, that you would teach us your ways and help us to understand your word. Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit would teach us and instruct us in righteousness and would lead us to the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, as your children, that we would love him more. And if any are hearing this message who are outside of Christ, Father, we pray that you would draw them to the Saviour. And above all, we pray, Father, be glorified and magnified through the reading and preaching of your word and the lifting up of the Lord Jesus. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Well, firstly, where is Thessalonica, the place which we've just read about? It's a major city in Greece, the second largest city actually in Greece after Athens. Today, it's known as Salonikai, a coastal port, a city in the northeast of Greece. This city was established in 315 BC by one of Alexander the Great's generals, Cassander, who named this city after his wife. It became a capital, or the capital, of Macedonia, an important trade hub Later in the Roman Empire, it was found on that long east to west road through the empire. It was a very important city. The church is formed there in Paul's second missionary journey, which is between AD 50 and 52. If you have a Bible map handy in the back of your Bible, if you turn to that, you'll see the route which Paul and Silas, or Silvanus as he's known also, which they took, later joined by Timothy and Luke, who wrote the book of Luke and Acts. The journey, the second missionary journey, is recorded in Acts 15 from verse 36 to chapter 18, verse 22, and lasts three years, covering some 2,700 miles. And if you see that on the map there, you'll see they began in Antioch, which is north Syria, moving west across Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey, until they came to Macedonia, which is Greece. As they entered Macedonia, a church was formed in Philippi, as we read in chapter 16. And then they came next to Thessalonica. 
Thessalonica was almost the furthest they travelled on this missionary journey, the second one, some 1,360 miles from Jerusalem. Uh, the, The furthest place was Berea, which is the next stop. And then they headed south to Athens and then to Corinth, which is recorded in chapter 18. Uh, Luke writes to show that God's redemption plan in Jesus Christ was continuing to unfold in the history of the early church. As God's word is proclaimed, the Holy Spirit is bringing many to life and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the church is being built and is growing. And the subject this morning, which I'd like to consider with you, is Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. This is the message that Paul brings to Thessalonica. And this is the confession of the church. And we'll consider this in two parts today. Firstly, proclaiming Jesus is Lord. And then opposition to Jesus as Lord. The Apostle Paul and Silas journey from Philippi. They go via Amphipolis and Apollonia in verse 1. About 90 to 100 miles from Philippi. Three to four days journey. Probably staying at these towns along the way. And Thessalonica was the next big stop. The events in Philippi are still fresh, I'm sure, in their minds. The new church formed there. The house of Lydia, who was an early convert in the church. The healing of the possessed slave girl, their imprisonment and the earthquake, which led to the jailer asking, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, is the answer. But as they arrive in Thessalonica, nobody notices them. It's a busy place of trade and commerce. People come and people go. But they quickly find a synagogue to share the gospel with those familiar with the Jewish Torah. And over three Sabbaths, this is what Paul does. Although they probably stayed longer in the city. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9, Paul writes that we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. While they stayed in the city, they supported themselves while also receiving support from the church just formed in Philippi. As in his letter to the Philippians in chapter 4 verse 16, Paul writes in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. But imagine hearing Paul sharing the gospel in the synagogue as he reasoned from the scriptures, as it says in verse two. To reason is to discuss, to argue, to seek to persuade. And we see Paul doing this again and again in Athens, in chapter 17, in Corinth, in chapter 18, in Ephesus, in chapter 18, And again in Troas in chapter 20 and before Felix in chapter 24. Each of these occasions Paul Paul reasons from the scriptures. Paul's authority is the word of God. And this reasoning involved explaining, as the passage says, or opening up the scriptures and proving or setting before, laying out, bringing the scriptures forward as evidence. As evidence for what? Well, Paul's preaching is Jesus Christ. And the outline of Paul's gospel presentation we have here is that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer. To suffer unto death as an atoning sacrifice for sin. As Paul showed from the scriptures how it was necessary for the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, to come and to die, to suffer in the place of sinners. Perhaps Paul turned to Isaiah 
53, as we read earlier at the beginning of the service, how that he writes there, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And Paul reasoned from the scriptures, showing just as Moses lifted uh, the bronze serpent, perhaps turned to that passage. So the Lord Jesus Christ had to be lifted up. This was all necessary according to God's plan of redemption. It was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. For he was not abandoned to the grave, but triumphed over death. Vindicated by God, the sacrifice for sins is accepted. And now he is exalted and ascended to God's right hand. The apostles themselves bearing witness. This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, Paul says, is the Christ, is the Lord, the promised one that will crush the serpent's head, <clears throat> the son of Abraham, the son of David, God's chosen king, the long-awaited Messiah. Jesus is the Christ, the Lord of glory. What was the response to this gospel presentation, to Paul's reasoning with them in the synagogue over these three Sabbaths? Well, some were persuaded, the passage says. They were persuaded, they were convinced, they believed this good news, this gospel. As did a great many devout Greeks and leading women. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9, it says there that they turned from idols to serve the living and true God. Also in that first chapter in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says that our gospel, the gospel that Paul preached, came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Some were persuaded and they joined Paul and Silas. They became part of them, part of the, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were converted not just intellectual assent given to what Paul was saying, but there was a, a change of life as they joined Paul and Silas and became a part of the church. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul writes that you became imitators of us and the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. This was God's work through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, accompanying the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ as Lord. Many came to life and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the same gospel we preach today. For God commands men and women everywhere to repent and believe the gospel. For Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And so we preach Christ crucified and risen from the dead. Have you responded to the gospel? Are you persuaded? For it's necessary to believe the gospel, to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord for forgiveness of sins unto salvation and eternal life. To believe that Jesus died and rose for you. Are you persuaded this morning? If not, would you come to Christ and put your faith in him and him alone. 
what we find in this chapter is the church formed in Thessalonica as they joined Paul and Silas in faith in pursuing Christ. Being a Christian is not just head knowledge, but it's head, heart and hands. And so it is for us as well. It's relationship and discipleship. We are called to live holy lives as followers of Jesus. And we'll explore in more detail this over the coming weeks as we look at, God willing, the uh, letters to the Thessalonians. The church is a community and these new converts didn't go off and live their new Christian lives in isolation. Individually with the the latest books and podcasts or online sermon clips. No, they, they joined together and they grew together, as we will see, as the local church. How important it is for us to be members of and, and active in the local church as we seek to be at Providence, though difficult at present. Our desire surely is to meet and to encourage one another, to build one another up and to be the church of Christ as we meet together. The church's mission is to proclaim Christ. This is the mission of the members of the church, to proclaim Jesus is Lord. By being imitators of Christ, by speaking the truth in love, And we begin by being imitators of Christ in the church, in our relationships and through discipleship. As Paul came to Thessalonica, as we'll see in the opening chapter in his first letter, he lived among the people and he spoke the truth in love. And they saw his life and conduct and heard his words. They were drawn to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is our mission. This is our mission to proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see in the first half of this portion, proclaiming Jesus is Lord. And secondly, we see opposition. Opposition to Jesus as Lord from verses 5 to the beginning of verse 10. For the response wasn't all positive. There's opposition and hostility. The city is agitated into a riot by some who oppose the gospel message. They oppose Jesus Christ as Lord. And throughout Paul's ministry, opposition comes whenever the gospel is preached. And in his second missionary journey already in Philippi, there was opposition as the gospel was preached, as the church is formed there. And now in Thessalonica, the same thing happens again, although different context. And next in Berea, the next stop, as we'll see, it happens again. There was opposition to the gospel. And Luke writes these things to explain what happened, but also to encourage For following Jesus isn't easy. Is opposition expected or normal? Well, yes, and we shouldn't be surprised when it comes. For Jesus himself said, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. In John 15 verse 18. But Jesus shows himself Lord in all of these scenarios. Whenever there is opposition through suffering, he builds his church and nurtures his people. And so we see here some opposing Paul's preaching. The Jews were jealous, it says in verse five. And the King James Version adds those who believed not, the Jews who believed not. Seeing others following Jesus, they become hostile to the gospel message and to the Christians. They start a riot. They turn to unsavoury characters from the market. 
the SV says rabble, troublemakers, and formed a mob. They sit, set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason. In verse 5, we read this. Jason, it seems, is the one who had opened his house up to Paul and Silas and the others. It's probably where the church met together. And the mob seek for Paul and Silas and cannot find them. But they drag Jason and some of the brothers before the authorities. And they blame the riot on them. Saying that they've turned the world upside down in verse 6. They make an accusation that they are going against the decrees of Caesar. Saying that there is another king, Jesus. This is a politically charged accusation and the city authorities are disturbed. Luke, in recording this, shows a continuity with what he records in his gospel. This echoes the charge, the charge given against Jesus in Luke 23 in verse 2. <clears throat> How that they said of Jesus, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And so the people here make this accusation against the Christians, the followers of Jesus. On the one hand, they were right. The gospel does turn the world upside down, or the right way up. To follow Jesus as Lord will result in a life at odds to the way of the world. The exclusive claims of Jesus as the way, the truth and the life is not acceptable and seen as intolerant. The world will not have this man, this, this Jesus to rule over us. The message of the gospel which Paul brought here, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ in verse 3. His opponents sum up as saying there is another king, Jesus. What a testimony that uh, in this short time this fact is recognised that Jesus Christ is being proclaimed as Lord. But on the other hand, their accusation is wrong. Their appeals are political. And the gospel isn't a call to political revolution, to overthrow Roman emperors or governments. For Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, in John eighteen thirty six. We're to be subject to governing authorities, Paul writes. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Romans 13 verse 1. But of course we are to obey God first of all. But we are to pray rather for kings and all who are in high positions. Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 2. That we may lead a peaceful and quiet life. Godly and dignified in every way. By this he means we are to be able to practice our Christian faith and life. And a freedom to share the gospel in this way. So the conclusion of Paul's ministry here in Thessalonian in Thessalonica, we see at the end of verses nine and ten. Jason and the men are let go <clears throat> under bond, no doubt to behave themselves according to the authorities, uh, while Paul and Silas move on to Berea. 45 miles or so west the gospel finds success there too following the same pattern of preaching however the enemies of the church church in Thessalonica when they hear about this they travel to Berea too taking that 45 mile journey to agitate and stir up the crowds there too so hostile they are to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ 
surely to follow Jesus in Thessalonica is going to be hard. And so Paul writes his letters to them to encourage the church when he arrives at Corinth just a few months later. We may not face this level of hostility, but some do in the world, and it may come here too. Will your faith falter if this be the case? Called stood out? Perhaps God's not really for us. Why is life so difficult? And in some measure, we all face opposition and trials and difficulties. Paul writes to give hope, as does Luke, to keep on keeping on. Be encouraged. Be encouraged, is what Paul writes to the church and to us as well. For he says in his letter, in the first chapter, in verse 4, you are loved by God, that he has chosen you. Though these things are falling out to you, know this, you are loved by God and he has chosen you. And so he prays as well in chapter 3, verse, verses 11 to 13, to encourage, encourage the church and us as well. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. And at the end of the epistle, in chapter 5 and verse 24, Paul writes, For he who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Referring to the sanctification and being kept blameless until the day the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord who has begun a good work in you will perform it. He will bring it to completion. Accepting Jesus as Lord results in new priorities and loyalties in our lives. Transforming our relationships, our behaviour, our work ethic, our attitude, our ambitions... The Holy Spirit progressively brings about these changes. We are and will be salt and light in this world. And this will give us opportunities to share the gospel, but it will also bring about opposition to the gospel. For whenever the gospel challenges people, opposition is sure to follow. We're not to antagonise people or provoke or alienate we are to live peaceably and share the gospel in love but it doesn't mean that we compromise the message or tone down the claims of Jesus for the gospel message itself is offensive to the proud those Exclusive claims of Jesus, of being the way, the truth and the life, and many others as well. He is the only way to God, the only saviour of the world. Are offensive, seen as narrow. That God's judgment is coming on the ungodly. Is offensive in this world. The need for repentance is seen as judgmental. But without repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, men and women will perish and are perishing. So although the gospel message is offensive, we must be prepared as we are given opportunity in love to share. People can handle a Jesus who isn't Lord, the seen as another spiritual help guru. Whatever gets you through the day. But this isn't the Jesus of the Bible. 
Jesus of the Bible is Lord. And we're to faithfully proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord with our words, in our attitudes and by our lives. To stand on the truth of God's word, the gospel, and as he holds you firm, so stand firm in him. May the Lord help us to remain faithful to him as he is faithful to us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us today. We thank you for this passage in Acts and the forming of this church in Thessalonica. And though just a a short passage with limited details, we see here the fruitfulness of the gospel being proclaimed and how the church is built on the proclamation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And just as Jesus said, he will build his church. So we see this happening and we're encouraged to see this. And Father, we long to see this being the case in our lives, in in our vicinity, in this church. As Jesus Christ is proclaimed as Lord. Father, would you draw men, women, young, old to the Lord Jesus Christ, for this is a spiritual work. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we pray, would you work in the hearts and lives, even of those who are hearing this message. And for you, for us, uh, your children, we pray, Father, that we would be encouraged in these days. Though at this moment we, we cannot meet physically, Father, we pray that we'll be encouraged in hearing the word of God and delighting in our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And should we face opposition, which we will and we do, Father, we pray that we would remain faithful to you. Help us to be wise in our conduct. Help us, Father, to be um, bold, to share as you give us opportunity. But Lord, we pray then all these things would be bringing glory to you by how we live, how we speak and our attitudes. Father, we thank you that this is your work in us, that you are sanctifying us and making us more like the Lord Jesus. And so we pray, Father, that you bless and help us in these things. We pray this for your glory. Amen.